All right, so we're just getting people joining in now. So if you're tuning in, um, we'll start in a few minutes. So do uh, take a chance to, to get acquainted. Um, and I'm just gonna flip us live here to Facebook. Thanks for being here, guys. I know it's, it's lovely weather here in Vancouver. We were just uh, commiserating with poor Grant out in Toronto on, on the lack of good weather there. It snowed, it snowed today. I'll put it that oh, way. No. <laughs> what a Canadian way to start this call. Absolutely. <laughs> Five degrees, feels like two. There you go. Wow. Nice. <laughs> Terrible spring. <laughs> okay. Well, I guess we can get going here. Um, so I'd like to welcome everyone for tuning in here on Zoom, uh, as well as those that are on Facebook. Uh, this is our second How To From Home, um, which is a new part of our How To series, uh, live from our, our collective living rooms. Um, I'm Jimmy from Music BC. Um, today, we'll be continuing on the topic that we started last week, which is how to find success through live streaming with experiences shared by artists and singer songwriters, presenters, um, as well as perspectives from the business side. Grant, you, you and Nick can speak to that. Um, also, thank you to Creative BC, Factor, the Government of Canada, and the Province of British Columbia. Their support continues to allow us to do things like this. So thanks again. Uh, a, few house, a few housekeeping things. Uh, we will be doing a question and answer period. Um, so if just at the bottom of your screen, you see a Q&A tab. Uh, I'd like to keep those questions uh, centered to there. So do, uh, do reserve the chat for discussions amongst yourself or um, quick feedback. Um, again, you won't have access to video or, or audio today, but uh, we definitely encourage you to engage with us on the Q&A. We'll do our best to get to as many questions as possible, but um, I'll keep track of all those and uh, we'll definitely address them, whether it's going to be here in the stream or after the fact. Um, for those on Facebook, that won't apply to you, but uh, we will be monitoring the comments, so definitely feel free to, to throw some questions there as well. Um, all right, so this week we're joined by Sage McBride. Hi, Sage. Uh, she is the core member, uh, one of the core members of Shred Kelly. She's calling oh, in you're from... back. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> calling in from Western Ontario. Hi, Sage. Thanks for being here. Hi, everybody. Sorry about that. My... Uh... Technical. Uh, we also have a producer, label owner, DJ, artist manager, I think a thousand other things too, Mr. Nick Middleton of Westward Recordings, and he is one half of the very successful electronic duo, The Funk Hunters. Great to have you, Nick. Thanks, Jimmy. And we're very excited to welcome a uh, three-time Juno Award nominee, uh, celebrated Canadian singer-songwriter and artist, Jill Barber. Jill, we are so excited to have you. Good to chat with you today, yes. Yeah. Uh, last but not least, I'm going to throw it over to uh, Grant Paley here, who's going to be moderating our uh, conversation. Uh, Grant's based in Toronto. He's a senior agent with Pecan Agency, artist agency, um, and I think he's got up to like 22 years of experience. So we're in very good hands. That's all for me. I'll see you guys at question period. Um, Grant, take it away. All right. Hey, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us today. Um, you know, it's been a, <laughs> the word of the, this, the year will probably be unprecedented. Um, unprecedented for our industry. You know, we've seen a massive change uh, in all of our lives, uh, whether it be our day-to-day, -day, our income, uh, even as artists uh, being able to express yourselves and, you know, grow your audience, connect with your current audience and, and just maintain a, a connection out there. Um, one thing that's become, you know, almost from day one is streaming. So here we are today discussing it. We've got three um, very different uh, people from very different worlds uh, working uh, on streaming right now. Um, I was, you know, I watched the other panel, so I tried to come up with a few things, um, you know, a little less on the technical details. And I think what we want to do here is talk about your experiences, uh, your successes, your failures, and, you know, maybe uh, where you see this is going as an artist. Um, so why don't we just start with, um, why don't we start with uh, Nick? Why don't we start with you? Um, and I, and, I, and I definitely want to start, uh, talk to you uh, about the different platforms that are out there. Um, you know, in, in, you're, you're working in the electronic world. Uh, what have been some of the, I guess, sort of the pros and cons of the platforms that have you, you've been using so far? Well, I think Twitch is definitely the biggest, um, you know, front runner um, as a company. I mean, their, their music, um, just the content under the music topic on Twitch has always been very low for them. I mean, predominantly they're a video game platform. Um, so that's been an interesting trend. You know, if you look at the analytics in the last two months, um, I think music stuff is maybe accounting for like 20% on Twitch, which doesn't seem like a lot, but it is a lot. And so 
um, of all the events that we've been running, I think the demographic has skewed probably to like 85 to 90 percent of all viewership has been on Twitch. Um, and I'm really seeing the other platforms as as just a funnel to push people to Twitch. Um, there's some obvious benefits there. Uh, just the way that Twitch handles content ID um, and for a, especially in the electronic world with a lot of people playing music that they might not necessarily have the rights to or at least not in that moment, um, you're gonna see your stream on Facebook or YouTube being muted or sometimes taken down. And so the Twitch streams will stay up um, and their content ID system will only go through the archive streams that stay up afterwards. So um, a lot of us are definitely viewing Twitch as kind of like the main stable platform where, especially for these longer multi-day festivals that are happening. Um, but definitely the idea of just getting it everywhere and capturing as many eyeballs as possible, I think still rings true. So I think for most of us, we're still broadcasting to as many other platforms as we can, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, at the same time as Twitch. Right. Sage, um, from the start, uh, when you started this, um, I think you've been mostly using Facebook as your platform, uh, a platform from the start, uh, or correct me if I'm wrong, but why don't you sort of tell us a little bit uh, of your experience so far uh, with Shred Kelly's. Yeah, we uh, we started using Facebook originally, but we used it or we used one computer and a phone to put it to Facebook and YouTube at the same time. And then the week later, we realized that you could use StreamYard to achieve the same thing. So since then, we've been using StreamYard to stream it to Facebook and YouTube simultaneously. So that's been um, really good. But we kind of had initially thought we were only going to be in this for a couple of weeks. So we thought we'll, you know, kind of like do free shows online to people on Facebook to kind of get through this. And then as um, shows kept getting canceled, and now it looks like the whole year is getting canceled, it's sort of, we're doing, um, we did our last Facebook stream last week, and then this week we're moving over to Side Door to try for the first time on Saturday. And then we're just going to take a little bit of a breather to kind of reevaluate how many streams we want to do. Do we want to do it all the time? Should we just be doing it um, like in partnership with festivals or other things that are going on? So we also tried one to Instagram, but the sound quality was, it was really challenging to get good sound. So I like Instagram for like an impromptu thing, like popping up and maybe being like I'm just sitting here playing a song but for, if you're like advertising and really trying to drive people Instagram in my opinion kind of had like the worst um, audio quality of the ones that we've tried so far and and did you see a lot of uh, the best engagement was was on which platform when you were doing those multiple ones it was was it Facebook was it where, where did you see the most action on that first one um, the most action on the first one was Facebook and that one had a lot to do like for us with timing because it was right as everything was starting and uh, we were like we've we had a show planned in our community that night so we're like let's do it instead of this show that was going to bring everyone in our town out so it was really like something like the timing really impacted that first one and then now that we've been doing it we've kind of watched like the viewership decline sort of over the weeks because it's kind of been the same thing so we're trying to reimagine it and how frequently we do it and things like that so right and then uh jill i think you're um the only panelist here that's used zoom and and uh and using dan's uh side door um what, what can you tell us about um sort of what was your decision to sort of go that route what was uh, what was the process of getting to that and then maybe tell us a little bit about what your how your experience was using zoom sure uh yeah i was um familiar with side door as a platform for you know booking alternative shows to begin with in fact um a couple summers ago we had dan mangan perform on our lawn a side door concert like when he was kind of still figuring out how it all works and we sold uh you know 100 tickets and had people squish in our front lawn so i like i was i kind of was into the idea of side door to begin with and i really uh was keeping a close eye on how they you know pivoted in this um post pandemic world. And um, I, it was actually watching Dan's weekly side door shows that inspired me to finally try to do one um, myself. And I think, I think um, I had a lot of reservations about doing an online show. I felt like it would just be um, kind of a crappier version of the live show, uh, but I've since come to understand that it's actually just, it's a totally different experience for the audience and for the performer. 
um, than a live show. It's actually um, my big takeaway from um, doing my own side door show and also uh, watching a bunch as an audience member is that it's for an online um, medium, it's actually a surprisingly really intimate. Um, and so I can get into more details as we move through this, but um, my general experience as, a, as an artist, I was really nervous to try to do my own live streaming show on Side Door. It was a pretty positive experience um, for me. And then I got a lot of great feedback on it as well. Right on, right on. So, you know, platform wise, it seems like, you know, the, the, there's there's a lot of different things out there and it's sort of i think catered to what kind of artist you are i mean nick again you know the electronic uh, artists you know dealing with the the uh, copyrights is a little bit different than an artist performing their own songs um you know i i agree with you jill i've, I've seen a lot of different streams and i've watched a few zoom ones i, I watched Tara lightfoots and what i really loved about it was you know the moderator everyone muted but when she finished her song you could hear everyone start clapping Mm -hmm. And there's a little bit of like, you know, you can see everybody in the room, whether or not they had their video on or their, you know, their audio on, uh, but most of your video and you can see people enjoying. Is that, is that kind of what you sort of felt um, you were feeling yeah. the same thing? Yeah, I mean, I, um, I, part of the magic, I think, of the side door shows is that you can, you can see into other people's living rooms, you can see other people watching, it's a collective experience. Um, so it feels a little different than just watching a uh, live stream on Facebook where you're not, um, you can't peek in, you can't interact or I know you can interact on, on the chat. Um, but I guess there's something about being able to just see everyone else doing the same thing that you're doing. It kind of creates, yeah, it, it creates, um, a, an online community. Everyone's there. I was at the, I saw the Tara Lightfoot show as well. And, um, you know, everyone that was part of that was there because of Tara. So there was a, there was a, a unifying factor that brought everyone there. And then for 60 minutes or 70 minutes, however long it was, you know, we were all actually experiencing live music together at the same time. And I think that's what so many people are missing right now is that connection through music. And I think this is one way to achieve it. Yeah, someone was, uh, I forget the conversation I had, but they were talking about how some fans were talking on the chat room going like, hey, I remember you from that show in Vancouver. I remember you. How's it going? And, and seeing that fans, you know, are also there connecting with one another. And, and that's what I really felt from the Zoom. I thought was really, really, really cool. Mm -hmm. um, especially a lot different than uh, some of the other experiences that I've been going for. Um, Nick, um, tell us a little bit about um, the, what, you know, your process from the very start of this, you know, to kind of where you are now. I, so I think I would where basically what I want to touch base with, um, you know, Sage and, and Nick might be able to, to, to dwell on this a little bit more, but the process of the development of where you started versus where you're sort of at now and maybe kind of where you think you're going. Nick, why don't we start with you? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I mean, we've been, pr I've been tr focused more on just trying to capture as many, you know, eyeballs as possible on the, on the streams we've been doing. So, um, you know, most of the streams that, that we've produced were bigger events with multiple partners and a bigger lineup. And so, I mean, the one that we did at the end of April, we, it was like eight hours long with seven performers, but it definitely um, helped capture more people. I think we had 120,000 views over the course of that afternoon. And um, again, most of that ends up being funneled to Twitch, but that's great um, because Twitch has its own, you know, subscriber notification system built in donations. It can be monetized. So, um, but <clears throat> definitely in the electronic world right now, I think that just the big concern is whether to put up a paywall in front of a stream. And it's hard to compete when, you know, you have the biggest DJs in the world delivering free streams multiple nights a week right now. Um, so I think really what we've been seeing is just like the benefit on the analytic side and on the fan engagement side, it's just been through the roof. And for a lot of our artists, they're playing to bigger rooms, you know, like we'll have on average five or 6,000 people at a time at any concurrent time watching sometimes more. And so they're playing, you know, you'd have to be at a pretty big festival stage to play in front of that many people. So I think the, the benefit of making these streams free right now is still far outweighing charging for a much smaller amount of people. Um, so that's been, that's been amazing. Um, you know, engagement on the metrics, you know, and analytics side on the artist pages is amazing. Um, 
they're, you know, staying, I think, more engaged than they are when they're on tour in a way from these streams. So that's neat. Um, <clears throat> but there's definitely a question as to like how long that's sustainable. And I think, you know, the way that our industry is structured is on scarcity. I mean, there's this idea that you want to buy a ticket to a show because you're only going to be in that town once that you're playing. And so if you're always available online streaming, what does that mean for scarcity in the music industry? And if we move over, you know, to an entire streaming model, then obviously that can't exist any longer. If we know that touring is going to start up again in a few months, then it's fine. But we know that's not the case. I mean, 2020 is essentially canceled at this point. So I think that's the big question that we're all trying to work through in terms of where we're headed. Um, I definitely think they'll just, I think there'll be hybrid models. You know, I think that you could still have a big free stream and collect donations. I think you could have a big free stream and you can have a VIP section where people can join backstage like this in a Zoom call before with the artist. Um, and I also think there'll be a hybrid model where when we have, you know, when we're allowed to mandate it to maybe have 20 or 30 people at an event, those could be super fans. We can still have proper production and then that event is streamed out and most of the audience is online. So it's a bit of, I think it's a bit of the wild, wild west right now, but um, I, I definitely think whoever is engaging with people online, whether it's free streams or smaller home concerts or whatnot, I think, you know, the thing that's clear is they're all be very rewarded when we, when we do get back on the road. Right. And Sage, what, what, what about you? I know that you, you sort of mentioned that, you know, your first um, weekend was a smash. And, and I sort of think about my own experience. Um, you know, I work with Fred Penner and, you know, I think the timing of the stream that we did, which was part of the NAC series that they're offering artists, um, you know, I think at the end of it, there was almost, you know, close to 100,000 views of his Facebook video. And at, at one point, we had almost 8,000 people tuned in between um, Instagram and Facebook. And we, we did the same setup as you did, Sage. We had two, two tablets, you know, going for two streams. But watching that, you know, I, I felt the impact was, was important. It was, it was the second weekend that we were in this pandemic. Uh, and people really needed it, you know, and now, um, you know, Fred and I have been strategizing and doing some different things, but we wonder if it'll have the same impact. So you sort of was, were, let's touch base on sort of like, you know, that, that initial show, you know, you had a big impact. And now that you're, uh, you're doing it more frequently, um, what is sort of the band thinking in terms of, you know, retaining that and, and kind of what you're sort of planning for the future? Yeah, so I think the first one, yeah, um, like you said, the timing was everything. And I think that that now it's been like viewed like 70 or 80,000 times, which is incredible, like, which is more than any views we have on any of our videos. So it was pretty impactful off the get go. But I think, yeah, it was this need sort of to connect right away. Everyone was getting bad news. Everyone had just been told to stay inside. No one know, knew how to deal with kind of like those things that they were being told. And um, at that point, it was just kind of like stop work, whereas now I think everyone's kind of trying to reimagine how to do the things they do. So for the first couple of weeks, it was just like, just stay at home and watch Netflix. And now it's like, okay, stay at home, but maybe also try to see if you can work on something else or be creative. And so people are kind of trying to get back to like some routine of their lives as well. Um, so I think what I would like to see moving forward is um, what Nick mentioned, like um, more collaboration with festivals, like festivals putting on events where they have a huge following where artists like us could go play on their Facebook page for free, but then we could gain more fans to do the side door thing to sort of say, we gained some new fans online by doing this. And now we're going to do something really special for just a few hundred people. So come there too. So you're kind of still building a fan base, but then doing something special with your fans in collaboration or, or working with towns if you're doing um, a CD release tour, because we have an album coming out soon. So we were even thinking of just partnering with each town, like a venue and um, trying to sell tickets through the venues, Facebook page or through venue zoom maybe, and um, partner with, um, some of the local businesses and see if they'd be interested in doing like a pizza night and a Shred Kelly show and only and like really target it to that like into Fernie or Revelstoke or Vancouver and really try to get people from that area to join in and say it'll be like all your friends who you would usually go to this show with and they'll all be there and the town's kind of supporting it and sponsoring it too so some more things like that might help um help us through but also as the weather gets warmer it's kind of difficult to I know people are going to want to be outside more so the live streaming is going to be I think we want to do it a little less frequently for the summer and then maybe aim to do more in the fall if we're still in this sort of limbo stage 
Right. Yeah. And someone asked a question here, uh, Jennifer Johnson, I, and I know we can probably just jump into this, but you're talking about, I think what we're already talking about is the frequency of these things. Um, Jill, um, let's talk a little bit about your experience. Um, I mean, how, how many, so the one thing that we're talking about too is, you know, we'll come up eventually and we'll, I think we can come in and out of it is monetizing these things. And with Side Door, uh, which is, you know, was a ticketing platform and a way to promote your show, um, you're doing the shows through Zoom. Um, what, I mean, how many, if you don't mind sharing, I mean, how many tickets did you end up selling for your very first one that you did? Uh, I sold 500 tickets for the first one. Yeah. Um, I found it hard to sell tickets. Uh, right. I would say that. Um, harder than I, harder than I would have thought. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's been, a, it's been a real learning curve. Right. Um, but the, the good news about monetizing that is I didn't leave my house. I had zero overhead expenses and yeah. you know like it put it you know it's gonna keep like keep the power on for me yeah. so to speak mm -hmm. it's like it's a way to continue working yeah. um as a performer um so that part's really cool um i feel you know to speak to nick's point about you know all the free content that's out there it's hard to it's hard to sort of put yourself out there and start charging. Um, I, like, I know that a lot of artists feel um, like now's our time to step up as artists and help, help it keep up the morale and put out the content and put out the shows. But I personally feel, I feel okay about, about putting a small ticket, attaching a small ticket price to it. Um, and for the most part, I think people have been happy to support. Um, I charged $8 for mine, which uh, felt, it's still, I don't know. It, it just, it's, it's, a, it's significantly less than what a ticket would be in real life, but um, it's, you know, it adds up. And to me, eight bucks, I mean, everybody, you know, it's a tough time financially. So for some people, it's more than they want to spend, but um, I feel like for a large chunk of my audience, $8 is not, it's a pretty nominal fee, yeah. to, you know, to support an artist that they follow. So, um, and to have a 60 to 90 minute, pretty intimate experience with an artist. Mm -hmm. um, one way, like one, one of my fans put it um, really well that like who, who doesn't want to be in, you know, in the same, like in the living room of one of their favorite artists being serenaded by them. And so like, that was kind of the experience that I felt like I was offering for eight bucks, um, you know, kind of a unique experience different than a live show. So I, I don't know, I personally, I like to see the movement of artists, bands like Shred Kelly move from free content to a small ticket fee because it is, it is at the end of the day, it's going to help you guys as a band survive this mm -hmm. and your fans, you know, probably want to get the opportunity to support you. So, um, yeah, I, 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 I like the movement towards monetizing right. things and there are still going to be the huge, the huge acts that do the free stuff and they're, they can afford to do that and all the power to them or to anyone who wants to put out free content. But I also feel like artists should feel empowered to um, continue to make a living through this, so. Yeah. It, it's interesting that when you talk about, um, when I think about it, you know, as an agent, you know, I, I'm always negotiating on behalf of artists and, and, and the budgets. When you think about that $8 ticket and, and you sort of hit the nail on the head there is, is your expenses are almost this much. You don't have to leave your home and there's no band to pay. There's no gas, there's no flights, there's no hotels. And if in the end of the day, when you really think about it as an artist, you know, that's almost the amount that you're taking from a ticket already you know if you think about a 20 or 25 five dollar ticket most of the time an artist is taking maybe what 45 50 percent of that you know that's that's or less super, not in my case not in yeah, my yeah, case like, i was just i was just thinking about that too when jill said eight dollars because i was thinking well just think if you were playing at a you know an mrg or live nation venue in canada you know for us artists a huge bit of that ticket fee is a service fee and yeah. you also if you're an independent artist maybe you're not paying managers business managers agents and then not to mention production mm -hmm. and promotion at the show so eight dollars is actually a pretty amazing number yeah. i think yeah. yeah and good for you if you're if you've got five, you know 500 people in a show is is great if it's, yeah, a, it's, if it's, it's a, a nice, show. yeah it's 
Yeah, I absolutely, and I 100% agree with all of you. I mean, you know, when, when you think about uh, $7, $8 is not very much to ask of anybody right now. You know, I, I, I think I've had a lot of those conversations where it's like I'm spending pretty much my money on groceries right now. Yeah, and, that's, that's right. There are, yeah. And so spending seven, eight dollars for a concert. And, and again, you know, and, and I, I think, you know, one thing Nick and I have talked a lot about is, you know, monetizing things. And we've talked about it. We had a meeting with our Fun Hunters crew. You know, you're really, um, you're really going after your hardcore fan base, you know, and that's who you're really going after, you know, because, you know, Nick, I think you, you had a really, you know, good point about going over, you know, going for mass. And I think if you're doing a free show and you want a ton of people viewing the social media aspect and the gains from that are worth it. And then I think when you're catering to your hardcore fan base, like you did, Jill, you know, 500 of your hardcore fan base were like, absolutely, I'm going to pay to see you live. I'm curious, what was some of the, the promoting that you did uh, to reach those fans to get those ticket sales? What were, some, what were the steps that were taken there? Uh, I relied almost exclusively on social media, um, uh, Facebook and Instagram and um, with my social networks. I, re I deeply, deeply regret that I've been really lazy on keeping a mailing list. Mm. I don't have a personal mailing list, but I'm kicking myself that I don't have that. Cause I think that's, I think like if you're able to get direct to your fans, as you mentioned, your hardcore fan base, I think that's the way to do it. So I'm starting, starting a mailing list. Um, <laughs> but yeah. Like social media, because yeah. yeah, that's it. That's, that's the way that's for me. Yeah. That's, yeah. And, um, and and Nick, what about uh, what about you in terms of promoting your shows? I, one thing that we touched base on here, and maybe you could talk about it, is partnerships. You know, the mm -hmm. um, the, the partnering with uh, bigger entities or partnering with similar bodies or you know someone with a big social media content. How has that been a key to what you guys have been doing? I mean, for the bigger ones, still putting the same energy and strategy into it that we would for any show. I mean, whether it was, even though it's not ticketed, I mean, it, it, the goal was still to, you know, have the most amount of people there. So, um, you know, definitely working with a press partner, you know, we sent out press releases for, I mean, for that big one that we did in April, we partnered with your EDM. They have like 2.8 million followers on Facebook alone. And, you know, we were cross streaming on their pages too, and had them as a press partner. So, um, I definitely think that's a great strategy and, and you know the, the same thing goes just looking for you know another model we haven't discussed is having a free stream where there's still income coming from advertisement and I think as you start to build a show a model where you say yeah 100,000 people are watching the stream then uh, why not have a you know a logo on the screen whether you know whether it's a company you believe with or your band associates with you know that's still to be determined but you know, you, you look at how much, you know, terrestrial advertisement costs or just traditional TV or radio advertisements. A lot of these bigger live streaming festivals are bringing in way bigger numbers than, than what are watching those. And so that's another model, I think, that's still being slow to be worked out that we're going to see soon is where um, the festival itself has a talent budget. They're sending out guarantees for people to perform, but then the festival is still being offered for free. Um, so that's a great one. Um, and the, the other one too that um, we haven't touched on that I, I think is amazing more for the band world is, is what um, like the folks at Live From Out There are doing. And I know oh, Frank, yeah, you and I were talking about that, but I mean, that to me is such a brilliant model because they're, they're saying we're charging, like this is not free, but we're doing it as a subscription. So here's the entire upcoming six week lineup of bands that are playing. And, you know, it's really presented like a festival lineup spread out of, over a long period of time. And there's a subscription fee for whatever, 50 bucks or something, you could sign up and you have free access to all of those streams for the month. And then the revenue is split in like a rev share model with all the bands, you know, similar to, you know, maybe how like Spotify or something would pay out. And then each of those concerts can also be purchased on demand. So, you know, if you had a great fan base, you can, you know, that want to support you, you can promote your upcoming concert on there to them. They could go buy that. I think it's six ninety five or something American. Um, but also if you manage to capture a lot of people that already had subscriptions to that ongoing six week festival and they had purchased, um, you know, a pass and they tuned into yours, then you're going to get a small revenue share from there. And, you know, from talking with Ben, they've paid out $300,000 American already it's in amazing. the last six weeks. So, yeah. I mean, that's a clear model. I mean, just the way they're doing it and being very deliberate about how they're doing it, that's really encouraging to see. So. I mean, there, there is there is so many options right now. And I, I think that's what's really tough for a lot of artists. And like Jill was saying, I, I think a lot of artists feel, you know, you look around and everyone is doing something. And so like you feel this pressure. It's like, okay, I got to get online and do something. So 
that's 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 you know normal and i think every artist is feeling that and there's no it, this isn't black and white and there's no right or wrong answer for you and it, and so much of it depends on like what you're comfortable with and doing and and how engaged you are with your fan base and and what your fans expect and how they want to support you but i do think to put a positive spin on it uh, the one thing that i would you know i've said to my artists is just that this is great because uh the playing field's been leveled so that's like an optimistic way to look at it where you might sometimes struggle to shine when you know a band that you look up to is just they're just bigger than you they're playing bigger venues they have more content because they're on tour well all of a sudden that playing field's been so leveled and so the amount of followers you have you know is, isn't changed but just the idea of like what you can do from your home with little production that's really been totally leveled out and so mm -hmm. that to me is is kind of exciting for some artists right now and and um i think it's it seeing some artists in the last month that maybe were a bit hesitant to get into it and are now doing streaming stuff on a fairly regular basis i see them pretty charged up about it i think it's given them like a new chance to like engage with fans and so mm -hmm. economically we still don't know what that means but you know there's it's definitely neat just to see fans engaged again and, and artists excited yeah and i think we're you know live from out there is very jam band focused i mean that's kind of yeah. uh a, 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 um a scene that's already really developed a hardcore following for custom content, you know, like, you know, fish fans want to see that concert from 1998 in that theater, you know, in that month when Trey played one solo that was the best solo he played all year, you know, and, and that's a very hardcore fan base that I was already used to that model, but it's been really interesting learning from Ben and his crew kind of what they've been up to. And now you surprisingly not happening in Canada. I mean, no, yeah. one in, I don't know why. No, I mean, we're doing it in the electronic space of partnering and bringing people together but why that's not happening in the band world in Canada I mean there's a market for it and you know if you go go pick your five favorite bands that you regularly tour with sit down together and cook up a, a stream in a month and start promoting it because you're going to capture so many more people and you're stronger in numbers and um, you know fans mm -hmm. will be more excited and and you have that problem right now where you there's everyone is streaming like your dog probably has a streaming show <laughs> one night a week right now so um you know you're stronger in numbers you can still cater to your your fan base and do smaller intimate concerts and offer them something different but if you can team up with a group of other bands theme it put on some kind of bigger event and if you want to make your life easy you can just pre-record the whole thing and then broadcast it like it's live so i mean it's neat that you you literally can just do that from your couch now um yeah. you don't need a big promoter or you know management team to pull that off for you and so that's that's neat Mm -hmm. Yeah, that part is really cool. We um, on our Facebook streams because we were using StreamYard, we were bringing in special guests every week, which was yeah. really cool because it was because um, I mean, part of this whole thing is like at first it sort of felt like self preservation, but now it's sort of like how do we continue to build that community. So I really like what's happening in the electronic community. And I wish that StreamYard had a thing because even when we were inviting people in, which was great. I love I love on Twitch how you can raid someone else's stream like when your set finishes, you can go to someone else's set and they can actually get those followers and you can like link people there so um i yeah i, I want to see i uh i know like for people who already have a following it's really easy to or not really easy but it's easier to reach out if you already have a fan base but um for new artists i'd really like to see sort of still like those opportunities for like opening slots on like these live streams or yeah festivals putting something together where newer artists can still get that exposure and build their fan base and we can all collaborate a bit more together um, so, so, and, and sort of your, you guys started touching base on it right now. And, and one thing I wanted to talk to you about it a little bit, it's, it's a little bit of technical, but also a little bit of the effect is sort of live versus pre-recording. Um, you know, I, I, we can start even, you know, I mean, uh, Jill, maybe we can talk, talk with you. I mean, again, just kind of touching base on, on the connection aspect. I mean, how are you all feeling about what are sort of the benefits of doing something live versus doing something pre-recorded? Um, well, obviously, uh, it's trickier for bands um, to do live stuff. I've been enjoying like the the videos I've been seeing, like the montage of everyone, you know, and the way they put it all together, and it sounds great and it looks great. It's not live. Um, as a as a, I mean, I, I have a band that I, I'm not performing with right now, but I can I can perform solo, so that's a big advantage in terms of doing live uh, streaming live streaming. Um, I will say that I recorded my live stream um, and made the uh, recording of it available after the fact. 
but I had this weird hesitation about sending it to people because I feel like part of the magic of the experience was watching it live. Um, I uh, not only like I, I not only played songs, but I did a lot of live interactions with the audience uh, in between songs. So like, um, yeah, I, I had invited people to get in touch with me ahead of time. And then I just kind of chose my favorite stories and then I would interact with the audience. And there was just something about that happening in real time um, with everyone watching at the same time that I thought kind of created part of the cool and unique experience. And just, just watching the recording after the fact, I think it's just, it loses a little bit of that um, je ne sais quoi when it's not live. So I enjoy the live aspect of it. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, that's part of what I think makes the side door shows kind of cool is that they're happening in real time. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, you, 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 then you have a lot of variables like technical glitches and uh, may not sound as good as you want it to be. Whereas if you record it ahead of time, obviously you have way more control in that respect. Mm -hmm. and, and Sage, I think you guys have been completely live throughout your broadcast, coming in and out, switching in and out. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, we've been live the whole time, which, um, which I think... I, I really like the live, but I think that there's a place for both, especially if we're going to be doing this for a long time. And um, I like the live because you kind of have that real connection and you're chatting with people in real time. And I think that that um, part is really nice for especially the fan connection and um, connection with other artists and just kind of getting to see um, an inner look at people that you don't usually get to see from the stage because you know lots of times on the stage uh, you're just sort of playing the songs or doing like a moment or two of talking but it's mostly music so this kind of gets to see this like rawness and like the stress of dealing with your program failing in the middle of it and all those things that you don't get to really get to see otherwise um, but then I also think I mean like once our band is allowed to be back together in a space that it would be really cool to like do an entire set pre-recorded and release that and put that up because that might be something that like the audio sounds a lot better. People might watch not just in the moment, but for years to come because it's actually something that sounds and looks really great instead of just kind of like that raw moment in time. So I think that there's a place for, for both. And if we're, if we're kind of indoors for a long time, just trying everything might as well. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, and Nick, um, Let's talk about a couple of your experiences because I, I was, you know, there with you to a certain degree watching it all. But you guys, you you did sort of a digital festival where you were, you know, going from one live stream to the next. Um, let's talk about that, and then I'd love for you to share your story on Live by Live, where it was a pre-recorded set. Um, maybe you touch base on a little bit of both of those of, of sort of your experience and the stories of it behind it. Sure. Well, the the ones that I was putting on that I was producing that were my own events, I felt like. Uh, one thing that was challenging for us to do was to compete. I mean, it's funny because the electronic world has had live stream festivals every weekend for the last six weeks of, of you know, of a massive level. Um, I mean, I didn't catch the panel last week, but I know Zach Jaffe was on here and, you know, he was organizing the Beatport ones, but there's been tons. Insomniac's been putting on big ones. Room service was a big one. Um, I mean, those are all pre-recorded. You can't participate in them if you don't pre-record. So um, they're happening live in the moment, being broadcast live. The chat and everything's happening live. People feel like they're watching them live. It's the only time you'll watch their performance, but they're all pre-recorded. And that's just because it's a, you know, it's just a bit of a technical nightmare to have, you know, three days of music like that live. But we uh, we decided, or at least I did, that we would do it live because I felt like that gave us one leg up where we maybe didn't have the same fancy production quality that that they had. Um, so we did do a, a number of the the live stream events, like bigger multi artist events. We did them all live, um, you know, which it's 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 a bit geeky to figure out, but it's not that technical and so yeah every artist is is streaming with their own obs setup it's being put up to the cloud we capture it down on a separate computer and we're basically like a tv studio we can mix between the live feeds and put up a host or content in the middle um, and then it gets streamed back out to all the platforms so um you know it's it's incredible that you can that you can even do that but yeah there's just you're introducing so many different elements um that could go wrong on, on so many sides so the pre-recorded stuff is is great um the weekly streams that we're doing right now, they're all 100% live, but that's just one artist. So um, I, I definitely hear from the artists and from the fans, you know, similar to what Jill was saying, that there's just, there's a there's a vibe when they're live that, that you can't capture. And I also think that people have been a lot more 
um, you know, forgiving when there's been technical glitches or times that the stream has slowed down and you can see in the thousands of people in the chat room saying, well, it's live, give them a second, you know, they'll figure it out. And, you know, all of a sudden it comes back up. And so there definitely has been a bit of magic there. And I, I think putting on those festivals, um, you know, we did one with Shyamalan Music Festival. I partnered with them and just having the feeling that it, it felt like, you know, a good you know, five to 10,000 people that would normally go to Chambla were there in the chat with us while all the DJs were playing live. And there was just like this magical moment where it felt like we had actually brought the community together. And there's no way it would have felt like that if we didn't do it live. Um, but on the pre recorded side, yeah, I mean, at, at my artist group, the Funk Hunters, we got invited to, to perform in the first virtual music festival that happened inside TikTok. And so my partner, Duncan, did the performance, recorded it, you know, live all by himself and, you know, even talked on the mic to try to pretend that it was like happening. And then you basically just upload it away to this production team and then you don't know what's going to happen. We're waiting and waiting and we find out that our set time was supposed to be Friday night and all of a sudden, for whatever reason, it didn't get in. So we're like, oh, well, now we're not in the festival and it's a three day non-stop festival and we find out on saturday night they're like oh you're on at 10 a.m sunday morning and so we woke up sunday morning <laughs> thinking what a horrible set time like why would we want to play at 10 a.m on sunday morning and i think on the friday night around when we were supposed to our set was supposed to have been there is on average a hundred thousand people watching at any given time and so on sunday morning we log in thinking this is a terrible time for a performance and of course it way better there is i think 320,000 people watching live while we were playing uh so that was just really mind blowing and it really opened up my thinking on what's possible and i think again it that one captured a specific moment because tiktok is you know the one of the biggest most viral platforms in the world right now and this was the first music festival that had partnered partnered with tiktok so when you open tiktok up it was right there at the top and um you know we had a 1 hour performance with over 300,000 people watching. I think in total, there was like maybe five or 600,000 people because it was on multiple platforms. And so I texted you, Grant, and was like, well, there we go. We just did all of our touring for 2020 yeah. in one hour. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's, just, it's, it's neat to see what's possible because, um, you know, and, and that's what you're gonna see on, on as these bigger and bigger festivals are happening. And what they managed to do is they just, because there were so many more people, it's because it captured this huge audience in India there was a huge audience of South Americans, a huge Asian audience. And it was just, it was interesting that 10 a.m. on Sunday just had three times the amount of people watching. And it really was a global event. And so that's something that just never even occurred to us. The other festivals we were doing, we were really appealing to Western Canada. I mean, it was like, and, and the Western U.S., was that's just where the fan base of the artists were. So seeing that open up and going, oh, my God, there's people from literally all corners of the world watching this. That's something mm -hmm. that wouldn't have even happened, I don't think, like a year ago. It, mm -hmm. So that's interesting. Right on, yeah. And so, and this is uh, so kind of talking about this, and and with the next thing I sort of want to get into in talking about is is frequency, uh, timing. You know, best practices of you know what do you think might be the best times to do it. So, Jill, um, what's your what's your next steps? What were you and your team? What are what are you sort of discussing on where is your next uh, performance and what what might it be? I mean, you know, I I'm having a lot of conversations here internally here at Packe about can we do shows at venues? Can we go to the great you know? Can we go to the Great Hall in Toronto and do a show? Uh, could you go to you know in Vancouver and play at the Commodore? You know, just do a solo set. Um, what are kind of sort of the ideas that you and your team are sort of thinking moving forward? But what's the next step? Well, I'm playing a show on Sunday in my new favorite venue, my living room. Uh, <laughs> I think, yeah, it's, uh, I had a little bit of the, that kind of excitement and buzz after my last show. Like I was buzzing, like, this is kind of amazing. That actually felt really good and awesome. made a bit of money. And like, I felt connected to people, you know, like it was, it felt, it felt like something real and valuable. Um, so then right away I was like, oh, I kind of want to do one again right away. But I, I don't know if that's the right call. I don't want to, you know. So my personal approach, I'm just taking it show, show by show. I, my last one was three or four weeks ago. I'm losing track of time. Um, and uh, I'm trying to come up with an angle for every show so that it's not just like, here's another show for me. So uh, like my, the angle for my last show was I played 
I played from start to finish a, an album, like my most popular album. And that was kind of the, it had an angle, it had a bit of a hook. And then the show I'm doing this Sunday is a Mother's Day themed concert where I'm interacting with, you know, um, my audience and people are paying special tributes to like amazing mothers in their lives that deserve extra recognition. So it's I'm, like, there's an, an angle to that. And then I have no idea what my next step is gonna be. Um, I'm rolling out a new album that comes out in June. So maybe possibly I'll be, you know, doing an acoustic version of that album, but I'm just kind of, I'm taking it, you know, day by day, like everyone day else. Um, I mean, I, the one cool thing, and everyone's been kind of touching on this, is I do feel like this whole situation is giving us permission to just try stuff and like see what works, see, see if it feels good. And, you know, and if you do a live stream and it's a bust and it, you have technical difficulties and it's a, it feels like oh, it was a terrible idea, you know, tomorrow's another day and you can try something different. Like, I think, I do feel like I've enjoyed I've enjoyed a little bit of the wild westness of all of this. And, um, you know, our industry, our music industry wasn't exactly like perfect to begin with, a perfect model that, that supported us as artists all the time. So, um, you know, there were a lot of things that were broken about it before. So I, I, I don't know, I'm kind of, uh, I'm definitely trying to take the optimistic approach of just like trying, experiment, experimenting and mm -hmm. um, making it about the music and about the audience and the connection. Amazing. Uh, Sage, say, you want to touch base on that? Uh, like sort of uh, uh, sort of the next uh, sort of things that you guys are sort of planning in terms of performances or venues or, um, you know, one question we had here from Bob Deeth, our, our, our friend Bob, uh, is about, you know, are, are there capabilities to jam as a band live right now? Can, can, can people all call into one place and jam? Uh, has there been any sort of discussions in the Shred Kelly camp about how to pull that off? Um, yeah, we were definitely trying to figure out a way if we could all play together from our separate homes, but the latency issues were um, in the way. So we haven't, um, although I did hear a rumor the other day that that might be uh, closer than we think. So hopefully maybe that'll ha change soon. But I think we're sort of starting to see like as the restrictions are lifting on social distancing that, um, or people might be able to open up pods or bubbles that in the next month or so, depending how things go, we might be able to be in the same space together, even if we're, you know, still six feet apart, but set up on a stage and then stream a live show together. So I think that's really where we would like to go is stream a concert where it's all of us playing together as we usually do in some capacity, because it's been great playing solo, but it's, um, uh, yeah, it's different and it's neat, but it's not representative of what we do most of the time. So it'd be really cool to be able to do what we do um, and live stream it versus doing kind of this um, solo version of it. So I think that's kind of where we're leaning to. And the other, the other thing is, I guess, just looking kind of for opportunities for partnerships, either with music festivals or other bands, like you mentioned, Nick, or we even had a, um, a fan reach out um, because he, um, he is involved with a group home in Ottawa and he wants to bring a live stream to the residents there and because he said that they're bored and they used to have people come in and do live music and so trying to kind of partner artists in a situation like that and then um, so it might be a way to sort of partner kind of what we're doing as an essential service to some people that might need it or try to figure out ways to get music to people who need it most and not just people who are fans. So there's a, yeah, it's, it's kind of, I think the first few weeks we were kind of like invigorated with the new, uh, you're just kind of trying to stay afloat and then you're kind of down for a few weeks because everything was crumbling and then now sort of trying to reimagine it and kind of see what else is possible. So yeah, lots of different emotions involved, but um, I guess, yeah, feeling inspired at the moment. So hopefully that sticks around for a bit. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Nick, I, you know, I, I think, you know, watching a lot of the electronic streams, I mean, watching some of the DJs from Sticky Buds or Matt the Alien or any one of them, I mean, the green screens, the production, everyone's stepping up their game. I mean, can you talk a little bit about um, what sort of needed in the electronic world to make it pop? Yeah, I mean, I guess it's, you know, similar thinking to, when you're at a live show too, <clears throat> you know, the, anyone can 
sit at home with a you know a pair of CDJs and a mixer and play music. Um, so how do you make that more interesting? You know, it's re really what it is. But yeah, I, I, it's just it's just amazing what you can do with just you know one camera and a good sound card. And so um, you know, even on Zoom right now, I can click a button and put a virtual background up behind me. I mean, just the, the tech that's just such crazy technology. If you saw that, you know. If you saw that a year or two ago, um, like you know, <laughs> the fact the fact that I can click a button and do that on Zoom is it's amazing. Um, but yeah, so that, really that's what we're seeing in in the in the electronic space, especially is is um, you know if you're running OBS, you could build a green screen behind you, have some lights, have multiple camera angles, and I think what's neat about it is it's it's really you know a lot of people like us and from our background where we came from, you know two DJs you mentioned Sticky Buds Matt the Alien but you know a lot of these guys Scratch Bass has been on some of our streams the guys who at their hearts are just incredible DJs that have amazing skills on turntables um, this is an amazing medium for them because that gets lost a lot at shows and a lot of the big electronic acts there's not much going on you know there's a lot of that's a big complaint in the electronic world there's a lot of pre-recorded sets there's not much live stuff going on you know, there's a lot of button turning and button pushing, but but nothing really happening. And so that's been really interesting to see some of these older guys like um, DJ Jazzy Jeff. He has his Saturday streams. Z Trip is now doing his weekly streams. These guys who are just like been regarded as as incredible performers on turntables. This medium is really letting that shine through. Um, and then also again, I think it just comes with that competitive nature when you see these bigger electronic streams and the production is so through the roof. It's it's just been so neat to see our artists take on that challenge. And like Sticky Buds, for example, you know, he just spent the last three weeks. He he waited before getting his live stream stuff up, and he spent the last three weeks building and investing this whole setup in his basement. And now he's got this phenomenal. You know, he looks like he's got like a TV studio set up down yeah. there and uh, <laughs> yeah, he's going to, you know, he's going to take on and start doing weekly streams. But for him, what's interesting is, um, you know, he's really, I think, and this goes to, you know, a tip for most artists is like, what can you do that's authentic to you? And is there something that you've always wanted to do that you haven't been able to do on tour? So, you know, for Tyler, for Sticky Bud streams, he really wants to turn his one hour show into a bit of a radio show. And he's got a microphone set up and he's talking about the music he's playing and where the new songs just came from and stories of the label in Europe or wherever, you know, whoever made that song. And that's something that, you know, he has this knowledge of music and he has these skills on turntables that's lost in the club most of the time. And so here's an amazing chance for him to do that. And we're seeing the same thing on Z trip streams or jazzy Jeff streams, just the ability for them to talk about what they're doing and talk about their craft. And I think it's the same for, you know, a live performer, you might not have your band with you, but the fact that you could sit there with a the guitar, and you have the space to talk a little bit about the song and the emotion behind it, where it came from. Fans love that kind of stuff. And we all love being taken behind the scenes into the music we love and behind the scenes with the artists we love. It's just not conducive to the live touring environment. We're there for a different reason, but that's why behind the scenes documentaries are so popular. You know, it's, it's why it's behind the scenes on Instagram live is popular. So being able to do that now is great. So I, I don't think that, we have to think about it the same way. Like we don't have to offer the exact experience that we were offering on the road. You know, mm -hmm. you can capture the same engagement offering something that's just authentic to you. And I think there's another model too. It doesn't have to be performance. Like if you look at what the small town DJs are doing with Pete, he launched a weekly show called Small Town Talk. Like he didn't want a DJ from home. So once a week he interviews another artist, they do it on their Instagram channel. He's had massive names on in the last few weeks. Um, and it's just been, you know, it's been, or he's doing it actually a couple times a week, but it, it's just been, mm -hmm. it's been neat to see. And that just plays into his skill set. So I think that's yeah. the thing, like, think about what you're excited about. Or is there something you haven't been able to do? And like, what can you offer? What would your fans find value in and, and go from there? Um, I'm going to let all the viewers know um, if you want to have a question uh, fielded, try and get it into to, to the chat window right now. Uh, and we'll field a couple of those um, as, as much as possible. We're getting uh, short to getting close to our end time here. Um, I just want to finish off with just a general, um, you know, how, how are you feeling? How are you doing? Um, you know, where, where do you, you know, what are you excited about in terms of all this? And I you know any, any sort of ideas, Jill, why don't we start with you? Just you, you have any sort of closing comments or ideas or anything like that? Just open forum. Uh, well, I mean, if we've learned anything from this pandemic, it's how much people 
count on art and music and film and television, you know, for our, just to maintain our, the quality of our lives. Um, I hope that at the end of it, you know, the general population um, can come to really value it, um, maybe more so than it has been. Um, I don't know, and I think, I think, uh, yeah, I think we need music as much, if not more than ever. And uh, I, the one thing, like we're all trying to figure this out, but the engagement is there and the audience is there and people are hungry for the connection through music. And uh, so I think, I think if we can, if we focus on that, um, then we'll all get through this together. Um, Sage? Yeah, I'm just uh, really excited to kind of see where things go. And I've, uh, I think the part that I've enjoyed most about um, everything that's happened is that we are, we usually live in a remote, or we do live in a remote area in Fernie, BC. And so a lot of the times it's really hard to connect with other people in the industry. So um, things like this have been amazing, like uh, so many webinars and so many ways to connect with people in the industry. And I'm, I'm feeling in that um, area a lot more connected to people than um, I probably ever have been throughout my career so that's a really cool part that I kind of hope continues after this and finding these ways not that we all have to be together all the time in order to sort of have those meaningful connections and um, yeah I'm just kind of I'm excited to kind of see what happens with collaborations and creativity and all the all the things that and I, I mostly I want us all to get back together but I'm I am excited for where it all lands after this is over. Uh, Nick. Um, I think, I mean, I think I kind of shared that the few things that I was optimistic about, like I, I, I'll say it again, because I think it's just a neat thing that maybe we don't think about. It's just that it feels like the playing field's been leveled out. Um, so that's, I think that's just exciting. And um, I think it can be intimidating for a lot of artists to go put themselves in front of a camera. So. I would just think about like, what can you offer? And it doesn't have to be you playing music. I think the important thing is just to not disappear during this time. And it's a, it's a really tough time. And I feel for, I feel more, you know, for the people behind the scenes, because I think there's less opportunity for them to do anything right now. And so, you know, so many of us work with amazing crew on the road and, you know, whether it's like tour managers or front of house engineers or stagehands or drivers, you know, Grant, you're an agent, our managers, um, promoters that, you know, we work with across the country. It's, this is almost even harder for them right now. I think it's easier for us as artists to look at our bank accounts and go, wow, you know, we just had hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars of touring revenue wiped off the books, but that's, um, you know, trickles down to everyone that we work with in the industry. So I wish I had more ideas for that side of the industry, but I think for artists, the important thing is just not to disappear. So, you know, don't feel a pressure that you have to put on a weekly live stream for free, but I think just, you know, in this time, don't disappear. Your fans want you, you know, like Jill said, you know, people want music more now than ever. And, and we're seeing that on, uh, on all the analytics and in every live stream that's happening. And, um, you know, one thing we didn't touch on, I just was reading an article this morning, but it just shows that is um, seeing companies like bands in town and ticketing companies trying to jump into the live stream space. They were finally publishing like some analytics from the last month and bands in town, just as an example, like a gig notification system, they were saying that their um, click through rate for festivals and club shows is like less than 10% and their click through rate this last month for live streams has been 80%. So like there's a demand there and people want to figure out how to stay in touch with you. There's just a lot going on. So uh, it's just to figure out what you can do to kind of cut through the noise and, and stay engaged with your fans. And, um, you know, it, we're all the playing field being leveled also means we're all in this together. So it's, it's you know, it's going to be a tough year. But, um, yeah, connect with friends and, and collaborate with other bands, I think, is the, is the best thing to do right now. All right. Uh, Jimmy, uh, where are you, bud? I think uh, Jimmy's going to come in here and... Uh, shoot us some questions and, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll call it a day here. Awesome. Yeah. Sorry. I've been skulking in the shadows here. Um, we'll, uh, <laughs> there you are. <laughs> we'll hold our virtual applause for, uh, for the end here. I know we're getting pretty cut on time, but um, there were quite a few great questions. Um, just like last week, we've had a number come in around 
royalties, rights, licensing. Um, that's a huge nut to crack. I know, Grant, you can probably speak from experience. We're kind of in uncharted territory now. So I think we're going to save a lot of that discussion for a separate um, how-to, mm -hmm. um, just in the interest of time. But uh, definitely know that this is something that we're, you know, on our end of Music BC and, and parts of the industry that are really like dissecting and kind of yeah, cracking that nut, in, 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 so to speak. Uh, as well, lots of uh, questions on monetization. I know we touched briefly on that today, but another great topic for a separate um, separate session. But uh, we do have a few here. We'll get to as many as we can, and then uh, we'll, we'll, say, uh, we'll say good afternoon. Um, the first one is uh, kind of on the same tip about collaboration. Uh, can you recommend a collaboration site for artists looking to find others to work on albums with? Is there kind of a form or a platform that any of you know about? There's a, a couple things. There's, I try to remember the name of it now. If I look on my Instagram, I find it. But this guy in Austin just launched this songwriting platform called, I think it's called like We Should Write Together. And it's like for songwriters to connect and write songs. Um, and then uh, Sounds Better is also, someone just wrote it right when I was going to say it, but they were an independent platform that actually Spotify now bought. But, um, but Sounds Better will link you with like engineers and various people that you could hire to work on your album. Um, I think it's called We Should Write Together or something was this this new one that I just saw pop up. Awesome. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good point. I think it's, it's really important to have these different virtual kind of meeting points to, to um, connect those dots. Um, this one's more around, uh, again, one on monetization. Um, does anyone here have experience with uh, pay what you wish or sliding scale payments, or even um, if there's a platform that caters to subscription or, um, or on demand models for artists to perform on? Um, there is, um, I know you can uh, set up a patron or patron site for, and then you can have a subscription. Um, also on our website, we just put um, on our merch page, a gratuity option. So we sort of direct people there when we are doing our free shows and just said, if you head over to our merch page and then it has merch and a, gratu a gratuity button. And I think you can also work that into Facebook, although that we haven't tried that yet. So I'm not sure. Yeah, of course, there's their side door you can work with. They, they basically, you know, act as a ticketing company. You can probably talk to almost any ticketing company out there um, and tell them what your needs are. Eventbrite, Showpass, anybody. I think if you just contact a representative, they'll probably come up with some solutions for you. You know, Shopify. I mean, there, there's just, there's so many different options out there for you to use. I've had an artist just put up a donate button to their PayPal account on their Facebook live stream and they, they received almost $2,000 in donations. Um, I think it all depends. You really got to think about who your audience is, um, uh, what kind of, you know, their demographic, who they are, you know, how, where they spend their money. Um, I've noticed that with all the artists that I represent, it's very different, my, my roster, and everyone has very different fan bases. And, you know, in that meaning an in income, an in age group, and, you know, sex, everything. It's, and, and you notice um you notice who's like, you know, some artists that you wouldn't even think that are getting paid a lot of money. They're making quite a bit of money right now and you wouldn't even think so. But it's because I think their, their specific fan base, again, is, you know, maybe they're a little bit more wealthier. Or maybe they're not. I don't know. Maybe they're a little younger. They don't have a credit card. Um, so those are all things to think about, I think, when you're figuring out a platform to use. Um, Sage, this might be one for you as well. Um, my question is, what is the best platform for two or three separate locations to present together and also make available for replay? Um, I know that, honestly, on this platform, Zoom Run right now, I mean, we are all calling in from separate locations as well as streaming to Facebook, and it does automatically record for you. So Zoom is one. Um, I know there's there's different opinions about sound quality, but um, Sage, how, how are you guys doing your, your stream tomorrow with, with everyone? Are, are you all together right now? Are you separate? Um, we're separate and we'll be using, we're doing it on Zoom, but that'll be our first time doing it on Zoom separately. So it might be a bit of a, a learning <laughs> curve. So we'll see how it goes. Um, otherwise, we've been using StreamYard just to do to Facebook, which we've really liked because you can add banners and things, which, um, so that's a really cool one, especially if you are doing something that isn't necessarily performance related, but if you were just going to do a QA and a with um, another artist or do like a bit of a talk with someone, then you can bring people up and have them both in the split screen and you can pop people's comments up. So it's a, uh, it's pretty cool and you wouldn't necessarily, you could use it if you weren't even doing um, live streams, but other interesting ways of connecting with your fans. stage. Um, Grant, this is for you. This is more of a personal question um, or, or maybe more of a professional personal one. Uh, as an agent, how are you making a profit these days? I've waived my fees. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I waive my fees during this time. I'm sure my artists can make a profit, but most agents can't afford this. I don't know if you, you're not obligated to add stance to that question if you don't want yeah, to. Yeah, no, man, I'm an open book. And, and, and you know, it's, it's, don't be wrong. This has been extremely hard. You know, um, the very, the very first days of this, I, I, I cried. I'll be honest with you. I had a couple of days where I broke down going, this, this is fucked up. I'll just say it. This is really, really hard. I get kind of teary thinking about it right now. Um, uh, it's, you know, our income went from a hundred to a zero, to be honest. You know, I, I make my living off of booking live shows. Um, I, you know, fortunately for me, I work for a, a really great company, Paquet Artist Agency. Um, I'm still employed. I've taken pay cuts. I'm, I'm working. I think, I feel like I'm working more now than ever. Um, albeit I've working less hours. Um, it's, it's really tough. I've pretty much pulled down the work I've worked the, the, for my years of work has been basically been pulled down within a few weeks, you know, and, and I've gone through it with my artists. I've gone through it with my family. Um, it's been really tough. Um, but now, um, you know, again, I, I'm, I've got a great employer and they're keeping me employed and I'm doing all my, all the things I need to do so they can also succeed as well and survive this. This is survival. Um, Albeit, I'm a, I, I'm very privileged to be in the position I am. Um, my family's comfortable. We're okay. Um, but right now, I'm I'm well, the one thing I am really happy about is I've sort of gotten past all the cancellations. <laughs> it's all done, and I'm now started focusing on work like this, you know. And um, I'm the way I look at it is I'm trying to concentrate on things I have control over. And right now, to be honest, everybody who knows when we're going to be able to do what we used to do there. We have no idea. And, and that's a question I get answered, asked a lot. And I have no idea, you know, I mean, most things and most people and you know, that working in sort of the higher levers of what we do, it's 2021 is really, you know, and, and I have artists big and small and some of the big ones I work with, you know, their, their budget lines for live music this year for their budgeting for their artists, it says zero. Um, and right now, you know, it's, it's, um, I, I would just want my artists to be able to uh, thrive in this. You know, I'm not, you know, I, I'm not looking to make any money. Here's my daughter. I'm sure everyone else is working with kids at home right now. Um, <laughs> this, this little one walks over going, daddy, are you done work yet? So we can play uh, almost every single day. So. Hi, uh, Winter. <laughs> um, it's, it's a it's a tough game for us agents right now. You know, there's a, a lot of disruption. I have a lot of friends down in the U.S. that, have been let go, have been fired. Um, I'm very thankful uh, for the Canadian government for supporting businesses throughout this. Uh, otherwise, I wouldn't I wouldn't have a job right now. There's just no way. Um, so right now uh, in the agent game, uh, I'll say this: as soon as the light turns green, I'm ready to start booking again and and booking hard. But until that happens, um, these things that we're talking about today, I want to be involved with. I'm learning. <laughs> this is all new for me as well. Uh, and it's exciting and it's fun. And I almost feel like um, I used to be an artist myself. I, I toured for a number of years. Um, I almost feel like it's a, a bit of a creative thing that as an agent, you, you don't get to do all the time. And it's been really fun collaborating with you, Sage, and Nick, and all the other artists I'm working with to kind of do some creative stuff. And I think that's what I'm excited about right now. And again, I, I'm privileged to be able to position to get to do that said um well this will be the last question and it's a uh, it's a good topic uh, obviously with with your daughter coming in there but uh this is from one of our, our audience members and one that i always have too and, and knowing that mother's day is coming up uh sage and jill happy early mother's day um Thank you. just just about how how parents artists um or professionals or yourself grant how how you guys are coping how it's affecting your process um i know everyone with kids in any field right now is feeling a bit of a, an extra weight on their shoulders, but maybe you can speak, Jill, you can start, maybe you can speak towards just your own experience as being a parent and an artist and live streaming and all that. Well, <clears throat> it was hard before all this to be a working parent, but it's like, it's, it's nearly impossible for me to, uh, <laughs> to get any work done. My, Husband is the one with the income coming in right now, the regular reliable income. So I'm basically just like full time. Um, I'm just full time with my two kids. They're four and six. So, you know, they're pretty demanding. And, um, and then the, the times that I work are when they watch, are watching a show or sleeping. 
<laughs> it's, it's, it's challenging. It's, uh, you know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to look on the bright side and enjoy the, um, the family time that I wouldn't otherwise be getting. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's challenging. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just to get anything done. <laughs> Tricky. Yeah. How about you, Sage and, uh, and Grant, you, I see your daughters appeared. <laughs> was, mine, are, was, mine are locked out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mine's been pretty locked out too. I see you go ahead. You can go first. Um, well, we, the first little while, well, it was funny because I went right from mat leave um, and then back. I was, I, I do work another job. I work at a childcare center when I'm not on tour sometimes. So I was supposed to go back to work there and then we were supposed to go on tour and that all got canceled. So then, um, I was just continued to stay at home, um, with Murphy, but, um, yeah, it was really challenging the first, um, six weeks, seven weeks, uh, is this eight weeks now? But last week we merged households with my parents and, um, Eve, I don't, um, usually have support and now we've, uh, merged the households. So we're in the same bubble. So that's been, um, really amazing because for the past week we've been able to, um, actually work on stuff and get stuff done. So that's been really amazing, but I definitely feel for everyone. We had seven weeks without any support. So I know what everyone's going through and it's extremely difficult. Yeah. It's just, a uh, staying up late and trying to tag off with your partner to get things done and uh yeah sometimes you just sort of feel like you're like this is your time this is my time and you don't really feel like you're you're just kind of like shuffling how you make it work together and that's for those of us that have partners I don't even imagine how people without even a partner support would be able to make this work so I'm definitely in admiration of those people yeah, it's uh, when when we got first started, my my wife was finishing her degree, so it was um, the stress of what I was dealing with with our our industry falling apart and dealing with that, on top of the stress of giving my wife her space to finish off her degree, and uh, it was really really hard those first three weeks. Um, it's gotten a little easier now that my wife has done her school. We're in a little bit of a groove here, um, and you know I've I've sort of. You know, as an agent, you're like, go, 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 go. And it was, it took a long time for me to sort of step back and go, I can't work like I used to. It doesn't exist. And so when I sort of got in that mind frame, cut my hours down to like, yeah, I only need to work like five hours a day, really. Um, it's gotten a little easier. We're in a bit of a groove here. There's still challenges. You know, there's, it's a three-year-old. Three-year-olds are unreasonable sometimes. <laughs> I can't imagine what it's like with two, Jill. Oh, my Lord. But, um, you know, it's, it's uh, my wife and I have turned into a situation where like, we've never spent this much time together as a family. And that's probably been one of the biggest trade-offs. And one of the, one of the best things about all this is we got, we're spending so much time. It's like, you know, you get up in the morning, eight o'clock, you get your kid to school, you go to work, you pick them up at five, you get dinner ready by six 30 and in your bed right away. And that was our lives. But now it's like this, you know, I'm taking my time making breakfast, you know, sleeping in a little bit more and, and slowing down. Uh, which has been a challenge. And Nick, what about you? I mean, you're, you're, I know you're, you're, uh, your wife to be a, a frontline worker. What's, what's it been like uh, in your, in your world there? Well, yeah, I mean, we don't have kids, but I just, you know, what you were touching on about being home. I, I spend most of my life in the States or on airplanes. So, um, you know, financially it's a, it's, it's can't say everything's positive, but um, I think for a lot of us who have been touring around the world for, you know, the last decade or so from, you know, speaking with all of the artists that I work with, everyone has been saying that it's been a neat chance to just be home and, and, a, and a chance to like have maybe time to focus on other parts of the business that you haven't and, and reconnect with family or your partners or relationships. So, um, you know, I, I'm always trying to be optimistic and look at the silver lining. So for me, as someone who's just toured for so long, yeah, just being home and waking up in the same place every day. I mean, this is the longest probably any of us have been at home in, in for years, right? It's been <laughs> almost two months now. So that's, that's crazy. It's so, um, yeah, that's neat. But yeah, I feel for anybody with kids. I mean, and also, you know, you guys didn't mention maybe because they need to be a couple years older, but most parents are also teachers right now. So yeah. it's just like, that's crazy. Yeah. 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 All the power to you. Yeah. And, and everybody working in hospitals. Yeah. My, my partner's a nurse, but um, yeah, it's tough. Yeah. 
Well, it sounds like a great place to leave it. Um, thanks, everyone. Uh, we'll, we'll do our virtual applause. I know you can't hear it, but uh, I'm sure everyone around, around the world right now is clapping for you. Um, definitely tune in. Uh, Jill's doing a, Mother Day, a Mother's Day show on Side Door on Sunday. Check that out. I uh, know tomorrow, Sage, you and Shred Kelly are doing a show at 10 a.m., I think. It's a cocktail brunch, mm -hmm. um, also on Side Door. And then, uh, Nick, I know you have a stream coming up in like 30 minutes here uh, on Twitch. So all these yeah. three artists are doing amazing things. And I'll, I'll make one plug too. Uh, Fred Penner tonight, uh, 7 p.m. Eastern, uh, Blue Mountain Village uh, uh, Facebook stream. He, Fred will be performing again. So there's one of my Yay. incredible. Nice. Well, Appreciate guys, thank you so much. Uh, have a great day. I appreciate your time. Um, I know everyone else will. So yeah, we'll leave it there. Thanks, Jimmy. Awesome. Thanks, thank everybody. Thanks, that was really Thanks, great. Bye. Thanks, guys.